Good to go? Yeah, you're good to go. All right. So today I'm going to be talking oh, about... Sorry, sorry. You, still, you still need to hit the, the like play from start button, I think. We'll oh, cut this I see. So maybe this doesn't work. Just play from start. Is this good? Yes. Okay. So today I'm going to be talking about um, independent reinforcement learning for two-player zero-sum games. Um, and this is actually from a paper of a different title. Um, and the reason I'm titling the presentation differently from the paper is because um, the algorithm which we, we have in this paper is called magnetic mirror descent. And this algorithm is, is good at a lot of different things. And one of those things is solving for quantal response equilibria. And I'm not gonna go into that too much here. I'm mostly gonna focus on the reinforcement learning aspect. Um, and this was work done with uh, a bunch of collaborators and, and Ryan DeRazio in particular played a large role. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm gonna rehash to start like some reasons I'm pretty excited about this, which are pretty similar to what Eugene was saying. Um, this algorithm that we have is competitive with CFR and tabular settings. And CFR is kind of been sort of the standard benchmark algorithm that you would want to measure up against for uh, solving tabular two-player zero-sum games. Um, you can implement deep RL instantiations of it. And these instantiations are competitive with uh, other modern deep RL algorithms in single agent settings. And I think probably this algorithm is going to be better than um, any existing deep RL algorithm for a large two player zero sum game. And on top of this, the algorithm is very simple. So a lot of these classical two player zero sum algorithms, um, they involve components which wouldn't be very familiar to. Uh, single agent RL people. And as a result, maybe it makes it a little bit harder for single agent RL people to sort of approach these problem settings. But MMD is something that would look entirely like a single agent RL algorithm. Um, so to sort of motivate that we're actually solving a problem here, uh, I'm gonna start by talking about why RL works in single agent problems and why maybe it doesn't work in two-player zero-sum problems. So you could probably think of why RL works in single-agent problems in a bunch of different ways. Um, but one way I like to think about it is uh, kind of through this idea of backward induction, or maybe you think about building blocks where you want to build a tall tower, so you start by placing a block on the ground, and then you place one on top of that, and then you place one on top of that, and then you place one on top of that. And this is sort of similar to what we're doing with reinforcement learning in the sense that at penultimate states, it's very easy to pick um, a good policy because you can just select the action that gets you the highest reward. And then at states two time steps from the end, you can just pick the actions that have the highest Q values, and you can just induct backward like that until you have a good policy for the whole game. So what about two-player zero-sum games? Um, so normally one thing that people, I guess, want in two-player zero-sum games is this idea that you're robust to different adversaries. So what this equation is saying is that we want some strategy for player one such that no matter what player two does, we'll, in the worst case scenario, tie. Um, and in a lot of cases, we might even assume that uh, we are literally in this worst case scenario where the second player is playing something called the best response, which means the second player is trying to maximize their reward, which is the negation of our reward, player one. Um, and we call the amount that the other player can win off of us the exploitability. So again, uh, roughly speaking, there are some maybe nuances about whether this is right, but um, a lot of the times we're looking for policies which have low exploitability 
and two player zero sum games, and that's kind of our notion of of what is good. Does anyone have any questions about that? Okay. So can we just run RL in two player zero sum games and maybe get something with low exploitability? Um, the answer is at least that it's not obvious that it would work that way because we don't have these building blocks anymore. Um, so to see that, we can look at kind of a game like rock, paper, scissors. Um, so normally you might think of rock, paper, scissors as a simultaneous move game where both of us pick our actions at the same time. But another way you could view it is where I pick my action first and I write it down and I put it in an envelope and then I give it to you. And you have to say what, you, what action you're gonna pick and then you open the envelope. So that's sort of how this game is displayed here where I'm the blue player and you're the red player. And the fact that the red player is unable to distinguish between these different envelopes is denoted by these dotted lines between the red players, uh, different nodes here. So before what we could do in these single agent settings was we could have the red player at the penultimate state pick the action or pick some distribution over actions that gets them a high reward. But here that's a problem because now the red player's reward is gonna depend on what action the blue player took and the red player doesn't know what action the blue player took. So this backward induction argument that worked before, it doesn't work anymore in this case. Um, so we might think, okay, well, the backward induction argument doesn't work, but maybe as a matter of practice, if I just run it, things will work out well. So I'm gonna show you an example of what happens if you do something like that. And I'm going to show it to you using this visualization of policies called the simplex. And in the game, uh, in this visualization, the corners correspond to playing pure policies, and the center corresponds to playing a uniform policy, and different points on the triangle correspond to different interpolations between those. So, what we're seeing here is a policy gradient algorithm running in self-play. And the purple star here is the Nash equilibrium. And actually, instead of converging to the Nash equilibrium, we're diverging outward uh, toward the peer policies. So not only are we not converging, sort of the worst thing that we could imagine is happening here, we're like moving away from the Nash equilibrium. So. Another perspective you might have is, yeah, you can come up with some sort of dumb tabular counterexample, but if I run this on a large game, that's all going to get washed away, and deep RL is, is going to do pretty well. Um, but it's not entirely true that that's the case. Um, so one example you can do, uh, which I ran, is in this game called Five by Five Abrupt Dark Hex. And despite the fact that this game is played on a five by five board, uh, the number of trajectories that can occur is, is actually astronomically large. So this is a pretty significantly sized game. Um, and I ran PPO for 10 million steps with the default hyperparameters over one seed from RLlib. And it actually does pretty well if you play it against a uniform random bot. So, it is true to some extent that in these complicated games, if you run independent RL, it's going to give you something better than trivial a lot of the time. Um, exploiting a random agent 96% of the time is pretty good. But at the same time, if you train some best response, some agent that's trying to exploit you, um, this PPO agent does extremely poorly. Um, and it's it's winning only 1% of the games here, uh, which is pretty close to as badly as you can do. Uh, do people have any questions here? Uh, 
Yeah, let me ask a really small question. Is this is yeah. the is the PPO entropy regularized? Uh, it's entropy regularized with the default um, for RLlib. Yeah, I, I don't remember whether it's zero or small value. It, it's really really small. Uh, so yeah, so with that small fixed value then. Um, okay. Um, so you might ask, okay, is it important for RL to work for two player zero sum games? And what I mean by that is um, there are communities who have been working on this problem um, and they've been doing it in sort of a disjoint fashion from single agent RL people largely. And you could you could definitely call the the algorithms they're working on RL algorithms in a certain sense, but they're not entirely something that would look familiar to single agent RL practitioners. Um, and some of these solutions they've come up with are quite good in certain cases. So one of these is is based on this idea that you can get some guarantees if you use this class of methods called that do this thing called regret minimization. Um, and so the sort of most prominent example of this is counterfactual regret minimization. And in tabular settings, um, this is extremely strong uh, at variance thereof. But it has some sort of nuances which make it sort of tricky to scale. Um, another class of methods is based on uh, this idea that you're going to use a best response or an approximate best response as a subroutine of your method. Um, but these can converge slowly a lot of the time. Um, so you may not get very good performance in large games. And then a third class of methods, which might leverage one of the first two as a subroutine, is based on this idea of public belief states. Um, but these are tricky to scale in sort of an orthogonal way that CFR-based methods are tricky to scale. So I, I would tentatively say yes, it, it really would be quite advantageous if we could get reinforcement learning to work for two players zero sum games because unlike all of these methods, reinforcement learning is starting from a place where it's very scalable and it converges in a pretty reasonable fashion. So that said, how can we get reinforcement learning to work? I'm gonna claim that actually, like the big result here is that we have a way to do this. And this way is called magnetic mirror descent. Um, so to tell you what magnetic mirror descent is, I'm first gonna try to walk you through what mirror descent is. And this sounds very abstract, like something that theory people work on, but I'm gonna encourage you to think about it as just like gradient descent, but maybe we're using a different notion of distance. So let's, let's think about an example here. Um, say we're trying to run some policy gradient algorithm and we have a softmax parameterization. So we're keeping some parameters Z and our policy is gonna be softmax Z. So if we just implemented this, what would our update look like? Um, if you just ran gradient descent or gradient ascent in this case, you would take your current parameters and you would move um, your current parameters plus a step size times the gradient of your expected value with respect to these parameters. Um, so there's nothing scary going on here. This is exactly what everyone is familiar with. Um, and this actually is mirror descent in the Euclidean case over logit space. So another way that you can write this, I'm, I'm not changing anything at all. This is exactly the same. It's just written differently, is like this. So now we're argmaxing over two terms. And the first term is telling us we want our next logits to be somewhere that the gradient says is good or somewhere that our Q value says is good. And the second term is saying we don't wanna to move too far away from our current logits. Um, 
And you don't need to really understand exactly the algebraic steps to get this equality, but just take on faith that it's true. Um, I'm going to stop here and see if anyone has any questions about this. Okay, so another, I said mirror descent allows us to generalize to different notions of distance. Um, another one that we might consider is this notion of distance, which is related to negative entropy. And this makes it sort of more natural to work directly in policy space rather than over our logits. Um, so this yields uh, a kind of equation uh, it looks like this. And it's quite similar to the one we saw before, but now instead of taking the gradients with respect to the logits, we're doing so with respect to the policy. And instead of wanting to stay close to our current logits in Euclidean space, we want to stay close to our current policy um, with this notion of KL distance. Um, and I'm going to stop here again and see if anyone has any questions. And so these two uh, different notions of distance. They, uh, so I'm looking at the kind of right hand, the right hand most side the way you're writing it. So it's like one's kind of doing this regularization on a logic space, but then another one is more so on the probability distribution on the policy. Yes. Is that the main takeaway? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, say the last part again. Oh, I was just going to ask if that's the main takeaway, uh, but you answered that. Um, so the main takeaway is that like mirror descent is this kind of general setup that gives us sort of optimization updates like this, that look of this form. Um, so you could do other ones too, and you could apply different notions to the policy space or different notions of distance to the logic space. These are just two particularly natural ones. Um, and the main takeaway, I guess, is sort of setting up what mirror descent is. And then I'm going to contrast that when I tell you what magnetic mirror descent is in a second. Thank you. Quick question. What makes it different? You mean when you say space, is it a different vector space? Um, yeah. So the first one, it, if we're working in logit space, it just means we're keeping some parameters, one for each action. And this is just living in real valued space somewhere. But if we're working in policy space, then we're working directly on the simplex. The, the entries can't be arbitrary. They have to be between zero and one, and they have to normalize to one. Okay, but both because I see that you have an inner product there on on the second and the third, so they're both on, defined on Hilbert space. It's just a different subspace. Yes. Okay. Okay, so now I'm going to tell you what magnetic mirror descent is. So. Before I said mirror descent is this generalization of gradient descent. Magnetic mirror descent is this generalization of regularized gradient descent. Um, so like before, we could look at doing this in Euclidean dis with a Euclidean notion of distance over logit space. And this is the equation we had before. Magnetic mirror descent looks like this, where we have this extra term now. And this extra term has this uh, coefficient alpha, which tells us how much we want to regularize. And I'm going to be calling this a temperature. And the regularization is towards some reference point or some magnet. And here, that point is zeta. Um, and you could imagine picking zeta to be a bunch of different things. If you pick zeta to be 0, then this is just saying I want to do gradient descent, but I want to regularize my parameters to not be too large. Or maybe you did some imitation learning and you have some policy which you don't want to move too far away from. 
So you might set zeta to be the logits from that imitation learning policy. Um, and similarly, we can do the same thing with this negative entropy setup. And now we get a term which says, I want my KL distance to this reference policy row, this magnet to uh, not be too large. And again, like one natural thing we could do here is pick rho to be uniform. And if we do that, then this just turns into an entropy bonus. Um, but we could also pick it to be some other policy that we might think is, is useful to stay nearby to. And I'm gonna stop here again and see if anyone has any questions. I guess I'm kind of jumping ahead here, but um, are your results later on going to be uh, completely agnostic to what row is, or will they uh, incorporate what row is? Uh, they're agnostic. Uh, they're largely agnostic to what row is. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, yeah, if you... There are certain cases where you would want row to be full support. Um, like if you have row that doesn't support some action that could cause some issues depending on exactly what kind of result you want to get. But, uh, largely speaking, yeah, it's agnostic to what row is. Okay. So, um, I've told you that this has some nice properties. I'm going to like very loosely state what these properties are. So this is like by no means exactly technically correct, but um, loosely what this, what this uh, approach guarantees for us is that if we have some one-shot game, so some game like rock, paper, scissors, where we both play and then the game ends, um, if we run magnetic mirror descent and self-play, we'll converge exponentially fast to a regularized equilibrium. So I can show you an example of this. And so this example is going to be where I computed this thing called the QRE, which is a particular kind of regularized equilibrium using a solver. And I'm gonna show you the KL divergence between uh, different iterates of magnetic mirror descent and this regularized equilibrium. So on the x-axis, I'm gonna show you iterations, and this is on a linear scale. And on the y-axis, I'm gonna show you this divergence, and this is on a logarithmic scale. And I'm gonna show you this to you for a few different values of alpha. So these are different temperatures. So again, a larger temperature means more regularization. And what you can see here is that on this log linear plot, uh, the lines are all decreasing uh, linearly. So that means sort of loosely speaking that these these um, iterates are converging very fast to these regularized equilibria. Um, and another way we could look at this is kind of qualitatively by looking at these simplex trajectories. Um, and what you can see here is that all of the different temperatures, I'm all initializing them to uniform, and the, uh, the number of spirals these iterates do is um, is related to the temperature. So if I have uh, a large temperature, it's going to converge pretty quickly, but it's going to be further away from the Nash equilibrium, which is the black star here. Uh, and as I make the temperature smaller and smaller, so green to yellow to blue, um, it takes relatively longer to converge, but the point that it's converging to is closer to the Nash equilibrium. And I'm going to stop here again and see if people have questions. Uh, Lucia in the chat asks whether this is annealing. There's no annealing here. So everything is constant temperature and constant step size. I have a question on kind of the, the spiral structure that we see on simplex. So what, what actually uh, gives it this kind of, you know, pretty spiral structure as opposed to something a little more 
chaotic, just kind of weaving around the simplex? Um, I would say what's giving it that is, uh, or at least one way you could think about it is that we have this exponential convergence guarantee, or some people would call this linear convergence. So there's a, in a certain no notion of distance, we have this uh, guarantee that our proximity to the equilibrium is going to get smaller at every time step. And that imposes a lot of structure on the kinds of trajectories that you can end up having. Thank you. Okay, so someone alluded to annealing. Um, and yeah, you might ask, well, like, what if I actually want the Nash equilibrium? Can I get that using annealing? And empirically, it turns out that, yeah, you can do that actually pretty reliably. So what I'm going to show you here again is a, is a GIF where the one on the left is going to be sort of a standard policy gradient approach, the one that we saw before. And the one on the right is going to be magnetic mirror descent with annealing. And what you're going to see is that magnetic mirror descent is going to converge or start to converge to something very close to the Nash equilibrium very quickly. And in contrast, as we saw before, um, if you just run a standard policy gradient algorithm, you're not going to have that property. So this is all well and good, but normally what RL people care about is not these one-shot games, but these uh, games if you have temporal extensions, so we're taking multiple actions over time. Um, and some people call this extensive form. Um, and if we run sort of this algorithm in its RL form in the setting, we actually don't have any theoretical guarantees, but as a matter of practice, um, we're able to get very reliable convergence with uh, appropriate hyperparameters. So I'm gonna show you some examples with a few different games. Um, again, I'm gonna show you a linear x-axis is the number of iterations. And the y-axis is the mean KL divergence where I computed um, one of these equilibria and I'm measuring the KL divergence between that equilibria and uh, the current iterate, and then taking the mean over all of the information states in the game. And again, I'm gonna show you this for some different values of alpha, which is this temperature. Um, and again, larger values mean more regularization. Um, what you can see here is that we're not getting the same kind of monotonic convergence that we got previously, but at sort of a larger time scale, we're still getting this kind of linear convergence rate or this exponential convergence rate. And I should just emphasize here also that there's no annealing going on here. This is with constant alpha and const a constant step size and a constant learning rate. So, so Sam, sorry. sorry, go on. Uh, maybe I missed this. Did, this is the behavioral update or is this the sequence form update? This is behavioral form. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so uh, the question there was asking about sequence form versus behavioral form. Uh, behavioral form is the kind of policies that reinforcement learning people are familiar with. Sequence form is a different kind of policy which um, you uh, comes in useful if you if you want to solve games, but it's a bit trickier to scale. So these are all in the kind of RL sort of formulation of policies. Um, so we can get this convergence with with constant um, temperatures and constant step sizes. Um, so what that means effectively is that using fixed hyperparameters, we can get value, we can get policies which have low levels of exploitability. So as you might expect here, um, if we sort of uh, look at the same iterates, the same runs, but we plot their exploitability instead of this KL divergence to these regularized equilibria, we have this initial decrease and then it levels off as it converges 
to this regularized equilibrium. And again, this is not with any annealing. This is with fixed hyperparameters. Um, um, sorry, sorry to bring you back to the one-step case, but can you can you handle the annealing case as well using some kind of like two time scale argument? Uh, um, so you you can get some we you can get some annealing results. Um, the annealing results that are obvious are not very useful in practice. Um, annealing results that would be like actually informative of how you should set your hyperparameters. We we don't have anything of that sort. I would say. All right. Thanks. But, but you can yes, you can do some like sort of uh, very naive arguments that would get you in certain cases um, asymptotic convergence to the unregularized equilibrium. Thanks. Okay, so uh, we've heard a lot of talk about annealing again. Um, and so it's it's a reasonable point, like maybe we actually want to get closer to Nash. Um, so one very relevant comparison point for this is CFR, which again is this sort of um, classical tabular solver, um, which is sort of the standard thing you would benchmark against. Um, so what I'm going to show you is these same games. And again, uh, I'm going to show you these exploitability plots. And on the x-axis now, I'm showing you a logarithmic plot. Um, and what you can see here is that if you anneal the temperature you're using, you can get pretty stable convergence in terms of exploitability. And you can do it at rates empirically that are pretty competitive with CFR. In some cases here, we're a little bit better, and in some cases, we're a little bit worse. So the whole motivation here um, was not actually that we wanted to be competitive with CFR ultimately, but that was sort of going to be our bedrock, and then we were going to take this and we were going to scale. So can we actually do that? Um, yeah, we can. Um, and in some sense, it's sort of obvious that we can do this because this objective is so closely related to um, many successful single agent RL algorithms that you don't have to modify single agent RL algorithms that much to implement MMD or some instantiation of MMD with deep learning. Um, so here's one example compared against PPO. And it's just on a few uh, Atari and Mujoko games. This is only over three seeds, so the exact numbers are, are far from reliable. But um, you can get a rough idea that you, you can get competitive performance with existing single agent RL algorithms. Um, another thing we might look at is, uh, does this actually beat these existing deep RL algorithms for uh, two player zero sum games. So one way we tried to measure that is in this game three by three abrupt dark hex, which uh, again is actually fairly large despite the small sounding board name. Um, and we're going to measure approximate exploitability. So smaller is better here. Um, and we're going to compare a few different things. One of these things is a bot which always takes the first legal action. One is a bot which uniformly randomly selects actions. And then the last two are a, a few different checkpoints of NFSP, which is sort of an older method uh, among deep RL methods for two player zero sum games. So it's definitely not state of the art, but um, it's a pretty fair baseline. Um, and uh, we're going to measure it at 1 million time steps and 10 million time steps, and we're going to do the same for MMD. And I'm just going to show you one seed here, so you don't have to do as much visual processing. But if you do this over multiple seeds, it's it's pretty similar. Um, so the scale here I'm showing you goes from 100 to 0. So 100 is perfectly exploitable, meaning you lose the game every time. And zero is unexploitable, meaning a best responder can only win 50% of the time against you. Um, 
So you see that a bot that takes the first legal action every time somewhat unsurprisingly is, is very exploitable to uh, a DQN best responder. Um, a bot that acts uniformly randomly is actually substantially more robust just because there are not these deterministic mistakes that can be taken advantage of. Sort of perhaps surprisingly, if you run NFSP, um, even after a million time steps, it's not substantially better than um, sort of as poorly as you could do in terms of exploitability. Um, after 10 million time steps, it picks up steam a little bit and you, you do get performance that exceeds that of uniform random. But compared to MMD, you, you definitely don't have the same level of efficiency in terms of convergence and approximate exploitability. Um, and again, you know, this is, this is sort of just uh, one example. Um, NFSP is, you know, not the best existing algorithm that can do this, but um, I think it's sort of not hard to believe that uh, sort of from the properties that MMD has that we're going to observe it comparing quite favorably to existing algorithms in, in more general contexts. Um, so just to summarize, I guess, if you're going to take away something from this presentation, um, we talked about how independent RL has these attractive properties. It's very scalable. It learns fast in some cases, but uh, it's kind of broken in two-player zero-sum games. And we also discussed a little bit how these good algorithms for small two-player zero-sum games are kind of hard to scale. Um, so the real reason I'm excited about MND is that it really gets the best of both of these worlds. It um, gets convergence tabu in tabular settings, which uh, is competitive with these classical tabular algorithms, uh, but it has the scalability of um, these modern deep RL algorithms. Um, yeah, uh, I guess we'll switch to, uh, you have time to take some questions? Yeah. Um, as usual, we won't record this part where we'll cut this out of the recording later, so you no know, one has to worry about uh, the questions being on YouTube. Um, but thanks so much.